Okay. All right. So my best friend lives in the North Shore up in Wakefield. And I don't have a car, so that means I have to get to Downtown Crossing, which is like an hour. And then I have to get on the Orange Line and go all the way to the end in Melrose at Oak Grove and take a bus. And you know, it's a, it's a pretty big ordeal, and it's a pain in the butt. But for some reason, I, I always liked it. And you know, I never knew why, because it was it's a crowded train, and there are a lot of funky people on it. And, most people think it's like the sketchiest line ever, but I don't know, I just I could ride it for hours actually, and I, I didn't realize it until, um, actually I don't know when I realized it, but it, it goes through this beautiful tunnel of graffiti for miles on each way, and realized that's why I like to ride it, because there's just so much to look at, and it, totally blew my mind and so that the, that's when I realized that I want to do that for my SYP. So I did a project in paper and for my paper I wrote big like 18 page thing. Well it's not really that big I guess but I um, go was to understand it. So I had to pick it apart and then write about it and I also had to defend it because a lot of people don't like it because, you know, it's vandalism and it's illegal. And, you know, a lot of uh, sh shop owners don't like it either. So um, mostly my thing was uh, defense. And my project was basically going out kind of aimlessly and seeing where I could find it. And probably one of the best decisions of my life. So. Okay, here we go. So, what is graffiti besides you know, the obvious, just, you know, paint on a wall? Well, basically, you know, it's a self-established name, you, and uh, you pick what it is, you pick what you want to put on it, you, you know, it's all up to you, and it's usually done illegally and in public places. However, there are some sanctioned walls, like behind uh, the central, uh, uh, the central kitchen in Central Square. There's, there's a lot of cool stuff there, and it's always changing. Um, and it's um, it's usually done with spray paint, paint markers. So theoretically, and you can use anything. Um, but it's, it's all about the name. Um, and you know, for example, um, Sky. Um, his name is Stay High 149. That's his tag. Um, he was a prolific writer from the 70s, and he was the first guy who used a little um, little symbol, and he um, he took it from the 1960s television sh television show The Saint, and he made it into a guy called the Smoker. So you know, it's, you can do whatever with it. Um, and okay. So, so that brings up the question, what isn't it? Because I think there's a lot of confusion between what it is and what it isn't. It isn't what you see in the bathrooms at all. That has, that graffiti is not curse words, it's not genitalia, it's none of that. It's also not really gang markings, because gang markings are just territory markings. And um, it's also not street art, and that is very, common misconception when people confuse it, but more on this later. Um, some important terms to know are writer, which is just a term for graffiti artist. Um, when the media came up with the term graffiti in the 70s, they didn't like it. So, they, you know, they just called themselves writers because that's what they thought they were. They were just writing their names on walls. Um, piece, it's just a painting, that's, um, and a tag, uh, it's just, is the writer's signature, and they put it up as much as they can wherever they go, and usually you find them in clusters, and that's what, that's what people see the most, and that's what, frankly, annoys them the most, <laughs> um, because it just, you know, it, it, it looks kind of dumb, but it does provide a purpose, it was, it's the original graffiti, that's where it all started. And that, that evolved into a throw up, which is just a quick, quick uh, piece done with spray paint, usually in two colors. Um, 
Crew is a group of writers and they almost always do really cool pieces because there are more of them and they can all work together. And if you see a crew piece, they're usually wicked cool. Um, and you know, wild, wild style. Um, there are as many styles as there are writers, but wild style is the most impressive one because it's, it's really complicated and it's, it's really cool looking, but really it's, it's kind of only meant for other writers on purpose because most people can't decipher it. I mean, I can't, so. But it, it's the coolest looking one. And finally, a burner. That's, um, this is really good stuff. Those are the kinds that I think people really appreciate the most because they're almost always wicked cool and they take a lot of time and a lot of practice and and that's what I was mostly looking for because um, that's where all the good stuff is. Okay, so this is an example of tagging. You see, they're in, they're in a bunch of clusters because one tagger tagged it and then another guy did and then it just kept going. And this is in an abandoned train right outside of Bunker Hill Community College. Um, and you know, I actually, I pass this train every time I, uh, I use the orange line and I always wanted to see it and I thought I was going to have to like hop a bunch of fences and I, you know, I can't really hop fences so I was really glad when I just had to you know, duck under some metal stuff and some train tracks and just found it there. Um, okay, and just a throw up. So you can see it was done really hastily because it's, it's not that good and they're, they're just, just kind of there. Um, again, those are a step up from regular tag. Um, this was under an overpass in Alewife, right next to the station. Um, this is an example of a wild style burner. As you can see, it's pretty indecipherable, but it's pretty cool. And that's kind of the whole basis of wild style. I mean, I, I can't even understand it. I don't know about you guys. But. And this, this is a burner done by a crew on a rooftop. As you can see in the back, right at the top of the letters, there are all the tags of the, of the crew. And they probably took a long time with this because the detail is pretty impeccable. Um, if, you know, from far away, it doesn't look like there are any mistakes. And this is the coolest, I think. And this is an example of why graffiti just isn't pointless. This is an example of its artistic merit, which I will get into further soon. Okay, so graffiti has a very long and complicated history, but I'll just touch on a few basic points um, for now. It started off in, you know, from the uh, 19th century on, on cross-country freight trains and hobos would ride them and they would um, carve or draw their names and their monikers to send messages to other hobos who would ride them, basically kind of um, alerting them of danger or where, um, where different food stops are, or basically anything. And um, it took off from there. Uh, I think one of the most uh, famous examples of this is uh, Kilroy was here. And that is the, um, kind of one of the symbols of World War II. Um, it was originally to, um, created by a guy named James Kilroy, who works at a Quincy shipyard, um, kind of building and shipping out uh, ships um, and parts. And he was an inspector, and so whenever he was finished uh, looking at them and they passed, he would draw this little guy on them. And then they were sent out overseas, and. Eventually, some World War II soldiers found it, and you know it really um, made them feel like they weren't alone. It made them feel like someone from back home was watching over them. So very quickly, they started to draw it everywhere, and then, then it just became a huge thing, it became a total morale booster. And you know, it uh, still is today. I think a lot of people look back fondly on it if they're still alive. That is, I don't know, but what most people, you know, don't realize is that it's a tag. And, you know, it's got the name, it's got the little identifying symbol, it's everywhere. And it's, it's one of the real forefathers of, of, um, of tagging and graffiti. Um, 
Gangs also play a big role in the history. Um, you know, again, they used it as a way to mark their territory, and also when they went into other gang territories, they would leave their mark. Um, however, it ha um, hasn't been at the forefront of the graffiti scene in, um, since the 70s, when it was overshadowed by graffiti as an art. And so, you know, it doesn't really hold any, any merit these days, but it was important because it um, was kind of a catalyst for graffiti as an art, because that graffiti as an art kind of did the opposite, where instead of limiting itself to territory, its aims were to go as far as possible and be everywhere. Um, so two of the uh, godfathers of, um, of tagging graffiti as a as we know it, are um, Cornbread from Philadelphia and Taki 183 from New York City. Cornbread, um, was just a nickname of his, everyone called him that, and he just kind of ended up writing it around. And, and Taki 183, um, he, was, he was a Greek kid from 183rd Street in New York City, and Taki was, it's kind of a, it's some sort of Greek nickname, I'm not really sure, but they, um, in their respective cities, they didn't start it, but they are the ones that kind of made it what a big thing because everyone saw them and was inspired to, to uh, follow suit. But graffiti's history really takes place in New York City. That's the main focus of it. That's where everything came from. Um, so talking 23, um, in the 70s, the New York Times Magazine uh, post, uh, published an article saying, uh, about, uh, titled, Talkie 183 Spawns Pen Pals. And after that, that's when the wave really started. Um, you had uh, taggers everywhere. And from those taggers came, you know, writers. And they became, um, and, uh, they just, the styles took off and it became more and more complicated and impressive and interesting you know, with each, with each year. And one of the most impressive movements that came out of this was the subway movement if that took place from the 70s all through the 80s. And that was basically when writers would, you know, sneak into uh, train yards in the middle of the night and they would just do these amazing pieces that span the whole car. And they took, I know it was just really time consuming and you know, pretty dangerous and there's always the risk of being caught, but that's all that kind of added to it, to the, uh, you know, it was a thrill of doing it. And there was, there, it was, I don't know, there, uh, they, there was a lot, I guess, there was a lot of train graffiti, especially on the inside, too. That was just kind of full of tags. And, you know, because of that, people didn't really like it. They, uh, people didn't want to ride the trains. And that's when, um, the police and the mayor started to crack down on it because, you know, it really pissed them off too. Because, you know, they hear these little hooligans were riding on their property. And I mean, I guess they were rightfully angry, but still, it was. If they had only looked, they would have seen how beautiful their trains were. But instead, um, Mayor John Lindsay in 1971 launched a war on graffiti which restricted the sale of paint markers and spray paint, kind of made it illegal to bring them into most public places. And in 1983, Mayor Ed Koch and the MTA, which is New York's you know, transit system, they put $20 million into whitewashing all the cars and putting razor wire fences and guard dogs outside of them, outside of the yards, so you know, people wouldn't sneak in. And, um, that's what really kind of put that to an end, because now it's pretty much impossible to sneak into a train yard. And so, so that that killed that, but didn't kill graffiti at all. I mean, it still lived on and traveled to other well, traveled all across the world from the 80s on, um, um, through the help of media and especially this book. Which is, um, which is called Subway Graffiti, and it's by photographers Henry Chalfont and Martha Cooper, and it was published in 1988. And this is kind of a cult classic, and it, it circulated 
all, all throughout New York and then it traveled across the country and then eventually people in Europe caught on to it and also um, there are some movies too. There's one called Wild Style. It was also in the 80s. It was by a guerrilla filmmaker named Charlie Ahern and it was it's a hip hop history film but focuses mostly on graffiti and that also helps kind of bring it across the world. And, um, anyways, as you can see, these are trains from the train movement. And they're, I don't know, I think they're pretty impressive. I mean, not anyone could just do that. But basically, the train was the ideal canvas for these kids. Um, it basically, it traveled throughout all the five boroughs. And that way, thousands, if not millions of people would see it. And that would mean that they kind of, you know, they got famous and that they, you know, they were, they were kings in their own little groups. And, you know, that was actually one of the, one of the main reasons why they, they rode, but I'll move on to that soon. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there is a marked difference between graffiti and street art. Not to say one is more valuable than the other, but um, a lot of people confuse it too. And, but really, graffiti is really centered on the name. It's all, it's, that's just all it is, it's just identifying yourself. Whereas street art, it's just, you know, it's any kind of art that uses the street as a canvas instead of a canvas. And, um, you know, it could be anywhere. And, you know, the street is a really powerful canvas because, again, you know, you have millions of people seeing it and instead of people who would just, you know, go into a museum. So, and, um, yeah, um, anyways, um, graffiti inspired the, um, the godfathers of street art, like Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat. They, um, they took the elements of it and the styles and they used that in their own art and that is carried on into street art today, like you have uh, Shepard Fairey and Banksy and, you know, they're, they're mis mistaken as graffiti artists for a reason because they share a lot of the same elements, but, you know, they're different. Because, um, when it comes down to it, graffiti is street art, but street art is not graffiti. And this is an example of just plain old graffiti. It's just a name. It's all it is. It's not serving any other purpose but to just tell people that the person was there. And this is street art. You guys may have seen this. It was, it's, um, it's a piece by Brazilian artist Os Himeos, and it's in Dewey Square, which is the former site of Occupy Boston. And as you can see, it's, it's not about the name at all. It's about the art. And you can't, you can't really, see, it's not as easy to see the meaning as with graffiti. And, you know, anyone can take what they want from it, which is, you know, one of the purposes of art. And, um, and this is an example of both. I mean, graffiti and street art, you know, really complement each other. And this, you know, this guy has his name and a big mural with it. And they both look awesome together. So, you know, they, not to say that they, they can't, they aren't, they aren't mutually ex exclusive. Um, all right. So people started writing in the 70s because, you know, first of all, it, you know, they did it for fame and for recognition within their own communities. But, and when I say communities, I mean the, um, the poor and disenfranchised youth of New York in the 70s. That's where it started from, because they were they were pretty much invisible to um, uh, the New York City government, and you know they may not have really um, meant for this, but. You know, they basically people kind of saw it as a way of them being seen and heard, and eventually they realized that people would see them. So, especially on the trains, a lot of writers kind of made a lot of pieces that had a message, like anti-war messages, for example. And you know, it really spoke to a lot of people. And you know, to this day, it still is a way for people to be seen and heard who otherwise would not be. Um, you know, and also, humans have kind of felt the uncontainable need to make their mark on the world. You know, one example is cave drawings. They, they, um, 
I mean, I don't want to say they were doing graffiti per se, but, you know, there are a lot of parallels there. And it's, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a primal need. Um, it's also one of kind of one of the ultimate ways of self-expression. And you're putting yourself out there, regardless of what anyone thinks. And basically, it's just for you. And the feeling of pride that you get after you put your name up there, and just when you see it every day or whenever, it's just it's, it's a really good feeling. And that's, that's a big thing for writers, and, it's, and especially now, now, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool. People, um, you know, it's used in marketing, you know, by using graffiti, um, a lot of, um, a lot of companies have, you know, made, made a lot of money. Like Mountain Dew, they have this commercial uh, for their new energy drink Kickstarter. And that is, you know, very flagrant use of graffiti as, um, as a marketing because, you know, they have a five second um, part of these guys using some expensive brand, making a cool mural, and, you know, that really appeals to uh, kind of the um, uh, 18 to 24 year old men, which is a really uh, um, coveted market, and so if it looks cool, people want to buy it. Um, so, well, this is one of the most important questions. Why should it be seen as art and not just random, aimless, self-centered vandalism? Well, first of all, you know, it requires all these things. It, you know, may not seem like it, but it requires a lot of skill, a lot of practice, and you need to be strong. And it's, it's not for the, the, um, the weak or the faint of heart. Um, it also takes a lot of courage because you could, you could always get busted and a lot of people don't want to go to jail. Um, it's also, um, despite it being illegal, it's, it's a really positive outlet, especially when it came out in the 70s when all these kids, you know, in the Bronx were just joining gangs. And so instead of killing people and getting in fights, uh, they would just do this. And it um, kind of really also changed gang culture as well because by doing this, they they put the, took their energy from that violence to something that was for the greater good in their in their minds. Um, it's also really accessible. It's an art form that anyone can do. Anyone. It doesn't. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to have connections. You don't have to have all these different supplies. Um, you're not appealing to kind of a an elite. A group of people who control the art scene, it's its own scene. It exists on a completely different plane from the art world. And, you know, I think that that kind of might take away from it a little because people don't understand it as much as they would actual art. But it, um, you know, it operates by its own rules, which is no rules. And the, uh, the elite is more of a meritocracy where anyone who practices these things, strength, dexterity, and skill, and put their time into it, and they eventually get good enough, they are the, they are the kings of graffiti. And anyone can be that way, regardless of how much money they have or whatever. Um, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Whenever, um, as long as you're somewhere where there's people, you will see at least one tag or throw up. Or you might see a mural if you're in a city somewhere. But you're never really alone when you have your feet there. At least that's how I feel. And that kind of ties into the whole worldwide community aspect where you know, every writer is connected um, by just this simple desire to make their mark on the world and change it. And, and that's um, it's a pretty powerful thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's, there's a lot in Europe in South America, and honestly, those um, those places are a little bit more accepting of public art, um, especially street art. But it's it's you know held in high regard there, and um, also there's um, it's a big internet community too. I mean, the internet connects everyone 
from the world, you know, to each other. Um, but especially with graffiti, I mean, there are a lot of websites and there are a lot of forums and there are a lot of uh, subreddits on it and there are a lot of pictures and, you know, everyone can see it and learn from it and talk to each other. And it's pretty cool. And also, you know, it just, it adds color to the world. I mean, a world without graffiti would be really drab, you know, just colorless and, you know, it, cities wouldn't be the same. I mean, it, it changed the history of cities. As um, uh, you know, really, it really changed the world in its in its own little way, you know. And so, it's not just kids wanting to mess things up. I mean, there are some kids who want to vandalize things. Of course, you can never get away from that. But a lot of writers today just do it because they want to, and they want to be good. And and I don't know. They're um, so, my, this, this is basic, the basis of my project, like where would a writer go? I, um, I had to put myself in their shoes and wherever I went, I had to use my intuition and to follow where I think they would go. And I, I found a lot. Uh, whenever I took a train into Boston or an express bus, I would see it along all the walls and along the train tracks. and. It always kind of broke my heart because I knew I would never be able to go there well, with all the barbed wire and the third rails and you know, police and all. And, but I, you know, I, I pined for them as I went by because a lot of them are really impressive. And, and they, um, that is a, a kind of an optimal spot because you know, if thousands of people going down the highway every day and riding trains and they see it every day. And, and it's also it's a really challenging spot to get to which kind of adds to its merit within the graffiti community. And also, um, there are a lot on trains and trucks, although there aren't as many on trains as there were in the 70s. But, you know, you, you see some. And it's also um, it's the most ideal because it just goes. It just travels, and even more people see it. Um, and there, you know, I saw a lot on kind of elevated places, like bridges, billboards, and. And these are the hardest spots to get to because there, um, there's the risk of death. So that um, if you can get somewhere really high, you are the coolest in the graffiti community. Um, and also roofs too, um, again, for the same reason. Um, and I saw a lot in abandoned buildings. That's where I was trying to find the most because it's kind of a communal spot for writers. I mean, the, uh, if, as you can see, um, if you've ever seen an abandoned building, they, um, buildings and graffiti, they just go hand in hand. I mean, they're just covered in them. And, um, and you know, basically every, anywhere there's a, there are people. Because if, as long as people see it, that's, that's what graffiti aims to do. Um, so yeah, um, for my project, I walked around. Um, yeah, I did, did a lot of walking, and a lot of I got really dirty because I had to like crawl under things and go through holes in fences and climb up fire escapes, and it was it was pretty cool. Cause, um, I got funny looks from people who worked in places that I was kind of prowling around through, but that that was the only bad thing um, about it. But you know, like I mentioned, um, I would pass an abandoned train when I went on the orange line. And whenever I saw it, I, would just, I just felt this giddiness and this joy. And that's what really drove me in this project because I kind of felt that way whenever I saw something like this. And I, I saw a lot. So, um, the, yeah, this is the abandoned train. Um, it's kind of a squatter's paradise. You know, it's pretty grungy, but I, I still want to go there all the time. Um, this is a crew burner under, um, under an overpass in Alewife. I had to go through a bunch of holes and fences, and, you know, it was worth it because I got to see these little guys, which totally made my day better. And so a lot of stuff on both sides of the walls, and, you know, it was just kind of felt like a little secret that I shared between myself and the people that were here before. 
Um, this is another wild style burner in Alston, and Alston has a lot of graffiti there because we have a lot of young people there, especially guys who want to be cool, and so they write graffiti. And, you know, in my eyes, they are cool for that. But this, there's a big wall, there's at least one that I know of, um, and the, um, the piece that I showed earlier with uh, the monster, you know, in the lab coat, and the big mural, that was on the same wall. Um, and this is, um, this is a rooftop I went on to. Uh, I had to kind of go up a really um, ominous fire escape and kind of climb across these different rooftops, but it's totally worth it. Um, and, you know, finally, um, I, uh, you have, these are my links. Um, this is my, uh, the WordPress is my official blog, but um, and my Tumblr is, you know, I, that's where I put my pictures because I have such a high volume of them and, and Flickr kind of told me that I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore because I had too many pictures. And, um, and WordPress just, just couldn't handle the file size, so I couldn't really put them on there. And so I just, um, Put them on a Tumblr and if you want to check it out, there it is. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> Any questions? Um, you mentioned that graffiti is a lot more accepted and prevalent in Latin America and Europe. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that more lax restrictions on graffiti in the United States would prove beneficial to the art form, or do you think that? Um, American graffiti has the inherent quality of it being illegal? Um, you know, I think that if, um, if, if um, the laws were more lax, there would be a lot more street art because mm -hmm. people just kind of write graffiti regardless of what the um, rules are and that, that will kind of never change. But, you know, street art is um, it's a lot different, um, like, um, mm -hmm. like I said, and it takes um, it takes a lot more time and a lot more energy. Well, actually, I don't know what I'm saying. That's, that's not true. But I, um, I, yeah, actually, to answer your question, yeah. And I, but I think there would be a lot more street art, mm -hmm. like graffiti. Yes, Ms. Does? A simple question about the um, definitions, about what it is and isn't. Are those definitions created? I forgot that. I didn't remember that. Um, yeah, yeah, because there, aren't, there, there isn't really like a set definition. I mean. However, if you look in the dictionary, it just kind of says the legal writing on the wall, which is, that's not all of it is, all it is. But um, yeah, I had to just kind of make my own clear definition for people to understand. Do you feel like it's been at all like, co-opted? Because you talked about how it started in urban areas mm -hmm. as like a kind of outlet for expression, and now it's being used in things like marketing for mm -hmm. Mountain Dew. Like, is that a problem, or is that something that you um, I think it was inevitable because it's it's basically part of hip hop culture, and hip hop culture is it's kind of a worldwide phenomenon. Everyone loves it. It speaks to millions of people, and graffiti is one of the uh, the four like kind of founding elements of it. The other three are emceeing, DJing, and b-boying, which is break dancing. And so you know, and these are those are all used in marketing also because they're just they're kind of the quintessential cool, you know, first it was rock and roll in the 50s and now it's hip hop. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really see it as a bad thing. It is what it is. You know, it doesn't really take away from it. It just, it kind of brings it further, actually, I think. Um, were you able to talk with any graffiti um, writers or street artists? No. Or that was, that was really hard. I, I sent. Oh, I wish. I, I, I wanted so badly to talk to someone. I sent out a lot of emails and I didn't really get anything back. And I also, you know, knew some people who knew some people, but that fell through too. So it's kind of on my own. I mean, yeah, it seems like it would be pretty hard to try mm -hmm. But there are a lot of right. books. <laughs> There's a lot on the internet. Yeah. So yeah. that helped. 
there any? Can you ask oh. a clarifying question? Mm -hmm. In the beginning of your PowerPoint presentation, you had talked about the fact that graffiti, what was not um, gang tags, like there was a difference between gang tags and graffiti. Mm -hmm. but then as your PowerPoint presentation um, followed through, you had made reference to gangs using graffiti to express themselves. Mm -hmm. So can you just tell me the difference between like gangs using graffiti to express themselves and the difference between, I guess, graffiti in that sense or in a tag, mm -hmm. like how they're, how one is not. Because I think what happens with a lot of people is they see graffiti and their first thought is like, oh, it's a gang tag or a gang has been here. So, so that's, what, that's the most common mm -hmm. um, thought process when you look at graffiti. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to see like, if you have like maybe a slide to show us the difference or if you can explain it so we have a better understanding. Um, well, gang graffiti doesn't exist to be creative. It exists as a, a warning, okay. basically, and so what did you say? a warning to you know basically for other gangs to see that you know you're coming into our turf and you're gonna get ganked. So it's it's just it, um, not to say that there hasn't been creative gang graffiti out there, but it just that's not what it aims to do. Whereas, you know, graffiti does aim to be creative and that is kind of the big difference between the two. And, you know, I didn't even see any gang graffiti when I was out, at least none that I recognized. I mean, it, you know, it is graffiti because it's all about the gang name and the gang identity, but it's not held in any regard whatsoever in the graffiti world. So, does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, are there any more questions? Ms. Do you know, in terms of like law enforcement, is there a certain unit or group that's in charge of graffiti? No, I don't think so. I think it also differs for, between you know city and city and town and town. I mean, there are a lot of saw a lot of um, pages on like you know government websites for cities that are like that are totally anti graffiti and a lot of really funny YouTube videos against it. But I think there's like you know, graffiti, anti-graffiti task force. Although there were a lot in the 70s, especially the MTA, there were special like units for it, but I don't think there are now because it isn't so, as big a thing as it was in the 70s. And are there any more questions? All right, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>